Okay guys, it is another blissfully rainy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is a rainy Sunday afternoon. That would be Sunday, September 11th, 2022. Uh, September 11th. I know something happened on September 11th at some point. Anyway, and my mind tends to wander. Oh well, who knows? Water under the bridge, whatever it was. So uh, whatever that was, we're going to be looking more towards September 11th, 2023 and uh, September 11th, 2053 if there's such a thing. So anyway, I want to thank a couple of alert listeners sending me this long article from the French news service AFP. So this is like the mainstream media in France. So good for the French mainstream media. This is uh, this long book-length article that we're going to make today's Sunday Sermon. This is from a longtime uh, environmental reporter, particularly uh, talking about climate change, Marlo Hood. And Marlo has written his uh, grand opus, Watching the World Burn. And I need to check the time won't have a chance to get to all of this, but we'll read at least the first half or so. So take it away, Marlo Hood, and tell us what you have learned in, I don't know, 20 years or so of reporting on the climate catastrophe unfolding on the planet. Take it away, Marlo. <clears throat> As the planet reels from unprecedented heat waves, floods, wildfires, and droughts, you may be feeling a rising sense of unease or even panic. <clears throat> My own oh shit moment came in early 2009, two years after I began writing on the science and geopolitics of climate change for AFP. So he's been going at this for since 2007. This is 15 years of looking back as a climate change reporter for AFP. I had reported on scores of peer-reviewed studies, talked to scientists, attended UN climate summits, and interviewed Pacific Islanders whose tiny nations were sinking beneath the waves. But the knee-buckling realization that unchecked global warming would upend civilization <coughs> had not yet hit me in the gut and left me gasping for air. <coughs> that sucker punch came at a conference in Oxford where a wide range of experts asked to imagine a planet that had warmed four degrees Celsius. Yes, Rascal, do I know you want to come out and join this rant. You love to join these rants. No, I'm out here. You got to stay in there. You can just listen to the rant instead of joining it. That sucker punch came at a conference in Oxford where a wide range of experts were asked to imagine a planet that had warmed four degrees Celsius. The tableau that emerged was a waking nightmare. It left me feeling as if I were in possession of terrifying knowledge that others, such as Book Hermit, somehow failed to see. Which is odd because the clear and present danger of climate change has been highly visible for a long time. Already in the late 19th century, Savante Arrhenius, the first chemistry Nobel Prize winner, predicted that doubling the CO2 in the atmosphere would, 
warm the planet by an unlivable 5 degrees Celsius. He was not far off. He even speculated on how that might happen. Burning too much coal. Uh, and anyway, guys, we, we've heard a lot of this. You know, he goes through all of the uh, previous warnings that uh, we had heard uh, going all the way back, you know, to last century, uh, you know, example after example after example uh, of how the world was warned, uh, how doomed we were, nobody paying any attention. And uh, so I guess it was 1988 that the United Nations created a core of volunteer scientists, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to update world leaders on the crisis. Four years later, being 1992, those leaders were sufficiently alarmed to hammer out a treaty to combat, quote, dangerous human interference with the climate system. And all of those uh, COP meetings began That's in 1992. And yet, most people seemed blithely oblivious to the killer comet, to the killer comet hurtling our way and saw climate change, if they saw it at all, as an avoidable future threat. My daily diet of scientific reports and projected impacts made it impossible for me not to look up as Greta Thunberg, as Greta Thunberg says. If you read the science, how can you think about anything else? I don't know, Greta, I read the science and I think about a whole lot of other things, but uh, we're talking about uh, climate doom and gloom here. Occasionally, I would encounter a kindred spirit, someone as quietly freaked out as I about where we are headed. But giving voice to an all-encompassing sense of dread is not something one does in polite company. So I exercised restraint. My one safe space was at home where night after night, year after year, I detailed the grim tidings from my beat to my resilient wife. But there was collateral damage. I cringe today when I think about the pall I cast over the lives of my two daughters as they grew into adulthood, especially the youngest. At work, colleagues, you know, fellow journalists, uh, fellow mainstream media journalists, berated me for the preponderance of negative stories in my reporting. We have to give people a we have to give people huh? We have to give people huh? Oh, <clears throat> said one. You should focus more on good news. Yes, just one problem. But there is no good news, at least not from nature or science. Since the world collectively decided 30 years ago to fix the climate and save the realm of living things, every single indicator of planetary health has dramatically worsened. In 2009, scientists identified nine planetary boundaries that must not be crossed. At that time, we had already stepped outside the safe zone of three of them, global warming, the rate of species extinctions, and too much nitrogen in the environment, mostly from fertilizer. Today, we have breached six of the nine planetary boundaries, probably seven. 
we are spewing out more greenhouse gases and pollution of all kinds than ever before. Hmm. The most common refrains in the thousands of peer-reviewed studies on climate change and environmental degradation I have looked at over the last 15 years are, quote, worse than we thought and faster than we feared. That is exactly uh, what it is. It is worse than we thought and faster than we feared as all of the real-time data is now available you know all of the predictions from 15 years ago are worse than we thought faster than we feared the worst case scenario is just has now just become well probably you know so what passes these days as good news is virtue signaling net zero targets from countries and corporations that depend more on planting trees and dubious carbon offsets than actually reducing emissions. In science, an endless stream of if we do everything right models chart fantasy pathways to a world in which Earth's average surface temperature never warms more than one and a half degrees above the late 19th century levels. The mercury has, you know, officially risen 1.2 so far, mostly in the last 50 years. Those well-intentioned storylines designed to show leaders and led alike that we can still avoid the worst are presented as quote technically feasible technically feasible which means they work on paper in the real world of vested interest and political pressure not so much. Tellingly, the last year has also seen frothy enthusiasm for engineering solutions, sucking that CO2 from the air, dimming solar radiation with stratospheric sunscreens that were dismissed a decade ago as desperate last-ditch measures. That may be where we have landed. In its latest report published earlier this year, the IPCC made it crystal clear there will be no climate salvation without major contributions from these and other technologies still on the drawing board or in their infancy. We are skating on well, fill in the blank, thin ice. Let's just say it, the Paris Agreement's one and a half C cap on warming is a mirage evaporating on the drought-stricken horizon. We will cruise right past it. Does this spell extinction level doom? Of course not. So you understand that this guy, we'll find out later. Okay, so this after all of this and what you're getting ready to hear, there is nothing anywhere uh, and anything this man has found in 15 years of studying the issue and drawing his conclusions. Apparently, uh, Marlowe uh, has not found any evidence that everything he is reporting on spells extinction level doom uh, or of course his editors at AFP uh, said dude we're gonna let you publish your little doomer porn on one condition well two 
it's put in this line here and then you know the hopium talking to the apocaloptimus at the end which I'm not going to get into. Okay. Does this spell extinction level doom? Of course not! But how bad things get depend on how deeply we wander into the hot zone. Beyond a certain threshold, and no one knows exactly where that is, the planet itself will significantly boost warming and release large stores of carbon that will overwhelm our already belabored efforts to slow and eventually stop human emissions. In the meantime, you know, while we're waiting for the carbon bomb and the methane bomb and the, all the other bombs, you know, that meantime, in the meantime, we are rapidly destroying Earth's life support systems. Oceans, forests, and soils are straining to maintain the steady state conditions that have made this such a hospitable place for our species over the last 11,000 years and could abruptly change course and race toward a new hothouse equilibrium as has happened in the past, warn the big picture scientist. That is not a world we can live in. So let's see, does this spell extinction level doom? Of course not. Then he tells why it does spell extinction level doom, or could at any day, and say that is not a world we can live in, which is another way of saying extinction level doom. I think the definition of extinction level doom is a world that we cannot live in. Maybe uh, something got lost in the translation from French to English, I don't know. Uh, anyway, with one climate enhanced disaster after another, reality is beginning to bite hard around the world. Paradoxically, this is, for many, reassuring, with lingering doubts long fostered by big oil finally extinguished. Finally extinguished. But Kermit, have you finally extingli extinguished uh, your climate denialism? <clears throat> A climate action Marshall Plan is surely the only rational choice left. Politicians are woke. Politicians are woke. The markets have awoken or awaken. But do they, meaning politicians and the markets, truly grasp that we have only seen a faint foretaste of the impacts already baked into the climate system. Even if we start throwing trillions of dollars, euros, and yuan at the problem, things are going to get worse, a lot worse, before they get better, and that is the optimistic scenario. There you go. The definition of the optimistic scenario, things are going to get worse, a lot worse, before they get better. And that, of course, is implying that they are going to get better. All right. Nor has it truly sunk in that construct that constructing infrastructure to protect against erratic monsoons can you say Pakistan month 
long bouts of deadly heat, can you say the U.S. Southwest, rising seas, mega droughts, can you say the Horn of Africa, and once in a 1,000 year floods, I think we've had like six of those in the past month, uh, and once in a thousand year floods is not a viable game plan. Yes, constructing infrastructure is not a viable game plan. Not even in countries brimming with money, engineering prowess, and can-do confidence. Imagine uh, Pakistan. But the focus of this lamentation is a state of mind more than a state of nature. What it feels like to work, you know, for reporters, what it feels like to work what we affectionately, affectionately call the end of the world beat. How does one carry that burden? Well, I will throw myself into the company of uh, reporters working the end of the world beat. How does one carry that burden? Well, I raise gladiolas and dahlias to carry the burden. Anyway, I get that question a lot from my students at the journalism schools in Paris where I teach. Sometimes I shrug it off with a joke. Monday through Friday is for despair. Weekends are for weekends are for weekends are for uh, uh, or I will attempt a serious answer explaining in general terms how journal how journalists most famously war correspondents erect emotional firewalls against the cruelty, suffering, and injustice to which they are exposed. <clears throat> For more than a dozen years on the beat, you know, on the end of the world beat, I convinced myself that I was unscathed by the steady drip, drip, of planetary doom and gloom. My sense of purpose was my shield, helping people understand that failing to repair the damage done will have dire and irreversible consequences. Following the science, my articles inched steadily over the years toward the language of existential crisis, but only rarely did I allow myself to truly contemplate what that meant to relive the intensity of my original oh shit moment. When I did, I clenched my teeth until the squall subsided and carried on. Now, the firewall is crumbling, his emotional firewall is crumbling, and I don't know how to rebuild it. In hindsight, it's embarrassing how long it took me, you know, a, a climate change reporter, it took me to connect the dots. Bouts of anxiety, sleepless nights, crippling nerve pain, flashes of anger. I had long attributed them to an unexceptional constellation of money problems, botched surgery, frustrations at work, and worries about my children. All of those were real, but they were not the only cause. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, I have to, for time, I have to skip over a little bit. Okay, 
I began to consult with a specialist for chronic pain. So he is uh, blaming his chronic pain on uh, climate anxiety and the end of the world anxiety. Are you listening? You know who. I began to, to consult with a specialist for chronic pain, a former anesthesiologist who borrows from the psychoanalytic toolbox to help his patients understand the sources of their physical torment. That unlocks some more hidden recesses, but the most obvious trigger remained invisible to me. Next year, uh, he won some big environmental journalism award. Uh, good for you, uh, brother. That came as a pleasant surprise. I think he's now in, this means last year in 2021, I think. Uh, that came as a pleasant surprise because news agency reporters rarely get the limelight. But it also threw me off balance for reasons I still can't quite grasp. About, it was about that time I started thinking a lot about what it means to live under the lengthening shadow of environmental collapse much as my generation had cowered as children under our school desks in rehearsals for nuclear Armageddon, but it still did not feel personal. There is a growing liter literature on the topic which goes by several names. Climate anxiety, eco-anxiety, or in extreme cases, doomism, doomism, yes, uh, you know, this uh, apocalyptic uh, opium addict, Catherine, Catherine, climatologist Catherine Hayhoe, uh, says, the preponderance of her haters on social media has abruptly shifted from climate deniers to doomsayers enraged by her message of optimism and uh, of optimism and uh, uh, hope. These so-called doomists or doomers, I guess in French it got translated to doomist, these so-called doomists have been excoriated by climate scientists and activists who see them as more dangerous than old school climate skeptics. But since these same experts shout from the rooftops that we are facing an extinction level crisis, they should not be surprised if some people lose their shit. If nothing else, it means doomists are listening. Alright, so wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh. But since these same, you know, climate scientists and activists shout from the rooftops that we are facing an extinction level crisis. What did we just read up here? That uh, I'm getting more and more convinced was thrown in uh, by the uh, editors. Does this spell extinction level doom? Of course not. And then here he is a few minutes later talking about the extinction level doom. There you go. You wonder why there's doomers. Huh. Okay. Anyway.
allowing ourselves to be emotionally overwhelmed by the threat of climate change is clearly an indulgence we cannot afford, which is why I don't do it. There is too much at stake, too little time to act, which is why folks doing strategic communication on global warming, the UN green groups, scientists, and arguably the media tread a very fine line. Yes. They want to scare people enough to take the problem seriously, but not so much as to make them feel hopeless. At the same time, they want to reassure people that a climate secure future is possible, but only enough to avoid complacency. I found myself straddling this dilemma when I started teaching a course on climate change. I immediately felt the weight of my students' expectations. They were like anxious patients, fearful of a diagnosis, and I was the doctor telling them to brace for bad news. I half-jokingly issued a trigger warning at the beginning of each semester. A crack has appeared in the conventional wisdom that a deep dive into climate gloom only makes people give up or tune out. In 2018, I met the founding members of the nascent Extinction Rebellion that used flamboyant acts of civil disobedience to spotlight inaction on global warming. XR has since morphed into a global presence. Induction begins with a crash course in climate science highlighting how we have tipped Earth into a rare period of mass extinction from which humans are not exempt. That means allowing oneself to be emotionally overwhelmed and to grieve for what has and will be lost. Yes. Um, anyway, he talks a little more about uh, extinction, re rebellion. Uh, back to, uh, you know, at a human level, I desperately want to deliver a sanguine vision to my students and people who read my stories, evidence that we can and will avoid the worst. But it is not my job or the job of any journalist to manufacture, to manufacture, to manufacture, uh, oh. To do so would not only be manipulative, but intellectually dishonest. It may also be self-defeating. Given the urgency I feel about the climate crisis, I yearn to explicitly denounce what I know to be harmful or wrong and to champion what I think is the right course of action, but acting on this urge, even if it were possible within the strictures of, you know, the mainstream media, would be a mistake. Yes. Uh, Fair-mindedness, neutrality, and especially the perception of these qualities are the foundation of our credibility as news organizations. Our stock in trade includes nuanced analysis of why something happened or may happen, but it does not cross the line from what is to what should be. More than ever, the world needs fact 
fact-based reporting that cannot be disputed even if it is sometimes ignored or distorted. Uh, I recently interviewed a trio of prominent actors in the climate arena not realizing the extent to which I was subconsciously fishing for advice on how to cope myself. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to go through these interviews. So what he does is, I mean, this is a long, he has an interview with uh, Earth System scientist Johan Rockstrom, of course. Uh, then, and needless to say, Catherine Hayhoe. I uh, don't need to uh, insult your intelligence with that clueless moron. Uh, that's the main interview. Uh, then a woman named Clover Hogan, who is an expert on climate anxiety. Uh, so he talks to her about climate anxiety and then he uh, talks about a former interview he had with James Lovelock. I did not realize that I did not hear that James Lovelock died this summer on his 103rd birthday. Uh, he closes his that this old interview we have with James Lovelock, quote, this is James before he went completely senile, quote, if we don't do something about it, we will be removed from the planet, Lovelock told me. Yes. Uh, Anyway, so getting to the bottom, so where does all this leave me? At a personal level, I realize that I can no longer chronicle day after day the accelerating destruction of nature and the gathering climate storm as I have done since 2007. It's not burnout, it's self-preservation. There are now a legion of reporters to take my place, nor can I rally myself to believe once again that UN climate negotiations will deliver anything more than bitter disappointment leavened with just enough progress to keep the process from collapsing. So the UN Climate Summit coming up, wherever the hell that is in, uh, where is that, in Ethiopia this year, will be my last. As for, as for the battle between, uh, between uh, hope and despair, I find no solace in James Lovelock's vision of a good Anthropocene emerging from the ruins of a climate-ravaged world, nor do I have the slightest inkling, the slightest inkling of what it means to share Catherine Hayhoe's faith that we will prevail against all odds in averting catastrophe. But pessimism does not necessarily mean retreating to the Alps and pulling up the drawbridge. I am still energized by anger at the lies the half lies, you know, the bright green lies, well, that's included in the lies. The half lies, the greed, and especially the additional suffering they will bring 
in an increasingly unequal and unjust world. More importantly, where does all of this leave you? You may not have thought about it much, and you may not want to, but like it or not, the reality of climate change is going to encroach on our lives, body, and soul. Brace yourselves. Amen, Brother Marlowe, and good for AFP uh, for publishing that story. Uh, I do not think that, at this point anyway, that Associated Press or Reuters News would have had the balls to publish that. It sounds like he got just a little bit of uh, interference from his higher-ups. Uh, now, I did not go over the, uh, the you know, the hopium, apocalyptic interviews he had. If you want to read all of that the usual crap, you can go on the link and read it yourself. But anyway, you look at, think of these damn dahlias. This is it for the gladiolas, but now the dahlias are coming in. Brother Basil, you told me I could not bring in dahlias in the Finger Lakes. Well, the Finger Lakes of New York you're now able to grow dahlias in if you don't mind waiting till September for them to get here. So anyway, guys, the Doomer Meetup begins in three days. We're going to have two more days of rain and then the weather forecast absolutely spectacularly gorgeous. So if you want to come join us, send me an email at collapsechroniclesgmail.com and come see us. Until then, uh, get out there and enjoy your doomism while you still can, my guys.